Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending my virtual State of the Coast talk. I'm really happy to be here um, for my first State of the Coast presentation to talk to you about the history of the Newport hydrographic line. This is a, a story that I'm pretty passionate about telling, um, and I will be telling it in book form, I hope, um, soon. I'm working on a book for OSU Press on this very topic, so look for that. Um, so the Newport hydrographic line uh, is an oceanographic monitoring program that has been collecting the same kinds of samples in the same ways in the same places for more than 60 years. And with all of that data collection, it has taught us a lot about how Oregon's ocean functions. And, and uh, so I wanna tell you a little bit about the history of the program and a little bit about what we've learned. So let's get started. Um, so here it is, the Newport hydrographic line. Again, this is an imaginary line in the ocean. It heads out into the ocean, essentially from Uquina Head in Newport, um, about 200 nautical miles into the ocean. So actually past the end of the map here. Um, and along the line are these standard sampling stations. You can see those dots there um, at which various parameters are collected. And I'll tell you about what those, what kinds of data are collected there in a little bit. The green stations are sampled about every two weeks, every other week or so, and the red stations uh, less frequently than that. So 60 years is a long time to be collecting data. It's a long time for a program to exist, but it's not the longest uh, oceanographic sampling program. In fact, there were two programs that um, predated the Newport line that probably inspired the establishment of the line. So one of them here on the left uh, is called Line P, it heads out into the ocean from British Columbia and has all these stations along this line terminating at what's called Ocean Station Papa or Station Papa Station P. Station P uh, is one of many um, weather stations that existed in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans during World War II, where weather ships, actual ships were stationed on that spot to collect um, meteorological data before we had satellites to do that. Uh, and so since the 1950s, essentially, late 40s, 1950s, um, data has been collected at these stations, um, terminating in Station P. On the right is a California program called Cal Coffee. Many of you have probably heard of it. Um, this is a program in Southern California. Here's Monterey, here's San Diego. And this is a grid of stations, as you can see, that was established in the 1940s um, in order to determine the oceanographic basis for the loss of the sardine fisheries on the West Coast. And so these stations are sampled multiple times a year um, up until today. Those are still um, existent. So these two state, these two programs were ongoing and along came a guy named Wayne Burt. Here he is, handsome fellow. Uh, Wayne Burt was the founder of Oregon State's oceanography program. So he had um, Navy money to pay his own salary to be the first uh, and for a while only oceanographer at Oregon State. And he knew that um, between Line P and Cal Coffee, there was this, um, wasteland essentially of where no data was being collected in the coastal ocean and he knew how important that was. So he wanted OSU, it was Oregon State College at the time, to have an oceanography program that one of the things it would do would be to sample this area and collect um, coastal oceanographic data. So he needed a few things to get that program started and it's a good thing that he was resourceful because those things were money and a boat and people. <laughs> So the money came first and he got that from the US Navy uh, and he got funds both to build OSU's first research vessel, here it is called the Acona, and then money for everything else, for labs, classrooms, people, salaries, um, buildings, and so forth. Um, and so in July of 1959, uh, the oceanography department was established with Wayne Burt as chair and he got busy first building this ship and then he hired some faculty members. And then in June of 1961, the very first Newport line crews went out. And they were asking some very basic questions at the time, like what is Oregon's ocean like? What's the temperature, the salinity, uh, how much oxygen is in the water and so forth. And so just like today, they went out every other week at those stations that I showed you uh, and uh, used what we would now consider kind of primitive um, techniques to collect that data. For 10 years they did this um, and that data is all still available. So 10 years in the money kind of ran out 
And there was um, a little bit of a lull in the regular sampling where students from OSU and others were still going out to collect data at those stations, but not as regularly, not every two weeks. They were also collecting uh, a lot of biological data at that time. So that's kind of interesting. They were collecting um, information about benthic communities and fisheries and about plankton for sure. Um, and luckily, there was a graduate student during that time named Bill Peterson, that name is probably familiar to many of you, who was collecting data along the Newport line at that time as a student. Um, and what he wanted to do after he graduated with his PhD was to come back to the area and get that Newport line regular sampling going again, because he recognized how important it was. And so he um, ended up at uh, a NOAA program called Globec. And he brought money from that Globec program to Newport with him to back to Oregon in 1995, specifically to reignite that, that Newport line sampling program. And so he got that started in 1995. And up from then up until now, that program has been ongoing. It's had some tough times, but it's hung in there. Um, and they have been sampling again, the same way at the green stations every two weeks. Um, and those sampling trips go out overnight in order to collect vertically migrating zooplankton. Um, they collect information about phytoplankton, zooplankton, nutrients, oxygen, temperature, salinity, pH, all of these very standard oceanographic measures of ocean health or the indica indications of ocean condition. Um, and then they take those plankton samples back to the lab so that they can look and see what, what they've got in there, um, what, what species and what and how many. Um, in 2006, um, high tech sort of came to the Newport line with these autonomous gliders that swim along the line and collect data autonomously. Um, they can go out for weeks at a time, year round. And then because of the existence of that program and the regular Newport line program in 2014, the National Science Foundation established um, the Coastal Endurance Array, which is a piece of the Global Ocean Observatories Initiative here. So this is a very high tech program with um, cables and, and buoys that um, collects massive amounts of data in the coastal ocean and sends it back to shore in real time. And one of their buoys is located right on the Newport line and some of their other buoys um, and equipment just south of the Newport line. So there are people going out there to collect data, there are buoys, there are cable arrays and there are these gliders. So this is a very well studied little piece of ocean. So what have we learned? Well, first of all, we learned how Oregon's ocean functions. And so there was um, a good deal of speculation about upwelling back in the 50s and 60s. And people sort of knew it was an upwelling area, but nobody had quantified it. Um, and so the, one of the first to do so was uh, Bob Smith, who was a student one of the first grad students at OSU. And um, he collected data on upwelling, the upwelling regime and quantified temperature, for example, that's the dotted line on this graph from his thesis and showed that the temperature is cold. The surface temperature of the water is cold in the summertime here it dips. And that's that cold upwelled water gets warmer again in the winter and then cold again in the summertime. And so that was um, one of the first times that this phenomenon had actually been quantified. We've also um, learned a lot about how climate, um, climate factors on a decadal scale control food webs and particularly salmon returns um, in the California current ecosystem. This is a contribution of Bill Peterson and his colleagues. I won't go over the whole thing in detail, but um, suffice it to say that um, different phases of the Pacific decadal oscillation, um, different water masses that are delivered under different climate regimes can deliver very different kinds of very different species of copepods that have different nutritional benefits to salmon. So this is the idea of some of them are fatty like cheeseburgers and some of them are more like celery. And um, so those can, th those are two different um, regimes that can lead to either happy salmon or sad salmon um, off of our coast. And then on a longer time scale, um, we, we can know what's anomalous, what's weird, if we know what's normal, right? And so here is um, just some satellite imagery of the, the warm water blob, this warm water mass that sat off of our coast for a long time around 2016 and wreaked havoc with our ecology. And, and so the folks that were collecting data along the Newport line could not only see the um, appearance, um, the genesis of this warm water mass, but could also observe how 
plankton and um, other communities changed, for example, um, over the time that that blob was around. So those are some of the things that we've learned from this line in the ocean. Before I wrap up, I was asked to say a couple of words about COVID and how it's uh, impacted me. And so I thought I would tell you that um, it's a little bit weird being a science communicator who doesn't do anything with respect to medical science at all in a time of a pandemic. Um, and so my roller coaster of emotions has been really, I'm okay, I'm, I have a job and I'm working and I have a home to quarantine in. Um, but also, I'm, you know, I've been incredibly stressed like the rest of us about the state of the world and then worried about like, does anyone care <laughs> about the kind of work that I do? And that's um, disconcerting to say the least. And then I think, okay, I think they do care, but I don't know how much. And so it's, it's just been this roller coaster of emotions during COVID, even though I'm basically fine. And, you know, the best news is that um, when I'm really down, I can turn to the best thing that happens um, during COVID for me, which is that my family adopted a puppy since we were all home anyway. And we welcomed this lovely dog, Timber, into our lives, who's been such a source of joy. So I wanna just flash up here um, the, some of the names of the people who have helped me tremendously during the course of this project and say thank you to them. Thank you to you for listening and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks so much.